What you're about to hear from me is not one continuous passage of scripture. I'm going to read several different verses from John chapter 14. You have the option of reading that whole chapter um, by yourself and seeing these verses in context. But I want to present them to you right now in this particular way so that you can see a theme that John develops in this section of scripture. So John chapter 14, and I'm beginning in verse 10. Jesus says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my word. And the word you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Here ends the reading of our Lord's Gospel. Last week, when Sam and I went to visit my mom, she had a pile of books that belonged to my dad on her dining room table, and she told us that we could look through them and take whatever we wanted. So Sam took a very large stack of National Geographic magazines and some of Pop's old geography books. And I myself took a very big brown paper sack full of good stuff. But the very best thing I took off of that pile in my mom's dining room was not a book at all. It was page after page of papers that had my dad's own words written in his own handwriting. There were some lists that he had made, notes he'd taken, many prayers that he had composed, and even a sermon he wrote on the fruit of the Spirit. I can't tell you what it means to me to have my dad's written words. My sisters and I have been longing these last nine weeks to sit down and talk to him because he was such a wise man and, and quite thoughtful. So Carrie, Carol and I have been wanting to hear what he would have to say about things that are happening in our world with the virus and especially what is his opinion about the political turmoil that's raging through our own nation in the midst of everything else. Hank didn't say very much, but what he did say, people listened to, and his words betrayed his compassion, his strength of, of character, his God-given goodness. They exposed his wisdom and his love for God and for humanity. You know, in the last 17 years of ministry, I learned that you can tell a lot from a person by the words that he speaks and the way that he speaks them. I understand why the words of Jesus became so very important to his disciples after his death capturing his words, they captured Christ's compassion, his strength of character, his divine goodness. They preserved his great wisdom and his love for God and for humanity. By collecting and writing down what he said, the first followers of Jesus gave each successive generation the opportunity to hear what he had spoken, and through those words to learn a little bit about him. But, but not only did they memorialize Jesus for us, his words teach us 
how to find God and how to enter into a life-saving, soul-saving relationship with the divine. It's interesting to me that the 14th chapter of John focuses on the words and the commands of Jesus because this chapter is presented to us in the gospel right before it tells us about Jesus' death. So it's almost as if the writer is urging us to look and see. Uh, Christ is coming now to die, so remember what he's taught you. Don't forget all that he has said. But of course, we only need to flip through a red letter edition of the New Testament, right, to see all of the words that are attributed to Jesus. Not every translation of scripture has him saying exactly the same words. And the four different gospels don't always have him deliver the same words in the same way, in the same context. But this isn't something that needs to concern us. Translations differ for a number of reasons. For instance, they differ because of the, the Christian tradition that they grow out of, or the time in which that translation was provided, or even linguistic study and development. And two, each of the Gospels is written for a specific purpose, and the writers tell their own version of the Jesus story. So it makes perfect sense that they wouldn't all tell that story in the same way. We don't have to focus on the discrepancies. Instead, we should focus on what's being conveyed through the words that are attributed to Jesus. And we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to allow these words to shape us as his followers? In the moments before his arrest and crucifixion, John's Gospel reports that Jesus asked his disciples to remember his words and his teachings and his commandments. So I want to take a few minutes to kind of run through that Gospel and to remember. So I'll begin with chapter 3, which is the first chapter in which we see Jesus deliver his first monologue. And in that chapter, we hear Jesus tell a man named Nicodemus, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So everyone can plainly see that what is done by him has been done through God. In other words, when we live in the light of Christ, we surrender to God. We allow God to work through us, and then we give God credit for that. In chapter 4, we hear Jesus tell the woman at the well, God is spirit, and those who worship God worship in spirit and in truth. See, worship isn't formed in our upholding of human doctrine. Worship is formed when we, in fact, surrender our doctrine to the truths of God. In John chapter 5, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, and there are some folks who are very upset about that happening on that particular day. They scold Jesus, and he says to them, I can only do what I see God doing. He surrenders himself to do only that which God would do and which God does. In chapter 6, Jesus feeds that massive crowd of people with those five small loaves of bread. And the very next day, many of the people in that same crowd went looking for Jesus so that he could feed them again. And he said to them, don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that endures to eternal life. That is to say, make your priority about giving yourself to God. In chapter 7, we find Jesus teaching in the temple, and he says, My teaching is not my own, it comes from the one who sent me. He surrenders his own thoughts and opinions to the truth of God. In chapter 8, Jesus says, You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one, but if I do judge, I stand with the one who sent me. 
Jesus surrendered his own judgments to the judgment of God. In chapter 9, Jesus heals a man's vision. And some of the religious authorities, the, the shepherds of the people, react to this healed man in a violent way. They cast him out from the worshiping community. So in chapter 10, we hear Jesus say, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for my sheep. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. So, once more, he speaks of his surrender to God, and, and not for his sake, but for the sake of others. Chapter 12, we hear Jesus speaking about his self-surrendering union with God. He says, whoever believes in me believes not in the one who sent me and who sees me, who, excuse me, he says, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in the one who sends me. And he says, whoever sees me sees the one who sent me. In chapter 13, he gives himself to his disciples and he washes their feet like a, like a slave would do. And then he says to them, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash the feet of one another. And then in chapter 14, where we begin, we hear Jesus say, those who love me will keep my word. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So I hope that I have been able to paint a picture for you. And, and the picture I want to paint is one that demonstrates how the words of Jesus are words of surrender, words of giving up self and identity so that he can be found and known in God. And, and this is the way in which he leads his followers. To make that point clear, just before Jesus is headed to his death, right, to, to his self-giving death on the cross, John's gospel asks us to think back on what Jesus has spoken. Words of God-centered surrender. It's very easy to talk about surrender and about dying to self. But it is another thing altogether to put that into practice. Our, our human disposition is naturally inclined to protect our ego. We, we want to look good. We want to save face in all that we do and, and whoever we are before. And so we protect what we stand for, what we value, what we, what we favor, what is our right. We protect what we believe in. But in the words of Christ, we find an alternate way of being. We, we find a new way. In fact, we find, we find a narrow way. And, and the way, the only way, to abundant life and God's eternal dwelling. The words attributed to Jesus are those of submission to God. And that's the way in which he leads us. Of course, I realize that this is not all Jesus said. And I can make that point too, which would thereby relieve me of the uncomfortable theme that I find in the printed word of Scripture. But if I do that, I am only betraying my own inner conflict with my ego. I, I have to admit that I'm ravaged by my pride. Pride that tells me to hang on to me with all that I have. I, I feel opposed in my heart and, and kind of struck down in my spirit. And I want to ask, really? Really, Jesus? Surrender? Is that what you meant? Surrender? You want us to surrender? 
You think that it will be life-changing and soul-saving for us to surrender our whole being to God? Are you, are you absolutely sure about that? Surrender? Let those who have ears hear the words of Jesus. We pray with me. Most holy God, we have heard the words of Christ. We have seen his actions, the work that you have done through him, the work of surrender, the work of giving to the other, the work of completely pouring out for the sake of love. We know that this is your testimony through Christ. We know it is your witness. And we hear the words vibrating in our ears and being planted into our heart. But what you ask of us is a great deal. All that we are, all that we have, most gracious God, we truly desire to please you. Help us then to hear the words of Christ. Help us to surrender. In his holy name we pray. Amen. May you go in grace and in peace.